Thank you, Walker, for the great introduction. And uh, as Walker said, uh, sorry, Ray, but this isn't talking about after initial IPOs and uh, the stock market, but it's used goods markets. And that's the secondary markets. And you might initially think supporting secondary markets, uh, well, that's just going to be a bunch of uh, tips about environmentalism. But actually, I'll just throw that in at the end uh, and show that it could go, in fact, either way. It could be pro-environmental or it could be against it. What I'm going to be talking about is firm strategic effects and how do companies uh, competing with each other react and what are their behaviors. So uh, first I'll show you why is the used market so important. Uh, there's been huge online presence in used markets recently. Uh, if you look at Craigslist, they have 12 billion page views per month. And eBay is a $50 billion company. And then, in a lot of uh, industries, the used market is, in fact, bigger than the new market. So in the United States, the used car market uh, has three sales for every one sale in the new market. And what's one use of the used goods market? Uh, that's the allocative role. So there's gains from trade because consumers are heterogeneous uh, in their willingness to pay for quality. So there's some consumers that always want the brand new high quality good that just came out. And then there's others that are willing to wait. Uh, so we see this, for example, of course, in used cars. Some people never buy a new car in their whole life. Uh, but then we can see it in smaller goods, too. Like uh, at Christmas time, a lot of people will buy a brand new iPad and then give the hand-me-down to a family member. So if they can't afford the brand new one, they'll be willing to accept the older, lower quality used one. And uh, what are some additional effects of this difference? What causes this difference in some people uh, caring more about quality? Well, uh, that same paper, Gavesa 2011, and co-authors, uh, says, well, what if it has to do with the amount of income you have? So what we have here is a graph showing income dispersion. And in France, you see that there's many people falling uh, at a similar income level. So that's why they're all kind of grouped towards the middle. And then in the US, there's a wide dispersion. So there's some really rich people and then some really poor people as well. So what do they predict? They say if there's more income distribution, there's more people who have different values on quality. So if there's some people that are really wealthy, always want new cars, then they'll always want to get the next year's new model and they'll have to resell that on the used market. So they predict if there's more income dispersion, then there'll be more trade in the used markets. And that's what plays out uh, comparing France and the US. So in the United States, there's uh, much more trade in the used car market than there is in France. Uh, the data they give is one in every three cars in France was new, whereas in the United States, it was one in every four. There were more used cars out there circulating. So since uh, used markets play such a large role in the economy, what we see is that firms might get involved. Uh, there could be some incentives here to maximize profit by intervening in the secondary market. So I'll give you the first example. Uh, this is what Ryan and I were talking about. Universal Studios and Redbox uh, had a lawsuit, uh, sue and countersue. And what happened is Redbox uh, was renting DVDs for a dollar. Now they're like a dollar thirty. And Universal Studios thought that was way too low a price for their DVDs. They're like, hey, we want more money than that. And so what Universal Studios did is it told Redbox's main supplier to cut them off. It said, stop selling our DVDs to Redbox. And then uh, they further litigated and said in their agreement they wanted uh, a new agreement for a higher price from Redbox and also they wanted Redbox to stop selling their used DVDs. So you could rent a DVD for a dollar and you could buy one uh, 12 days after it came out for $7. And they wanted that to end. They wanted to shut down the sale of used DVDs. And then Redbox uh, countersued and said, well, we're losing a lot of money. So the issue uh, went to court. And that was what Ryan was so nice to share with me. So what we see is Universal Studios shut down the used goods market. So that's going to be my problem statement. Why do some firms with market power either shut down or encourage markets for their used goods? So encouraging markets for their used goods is supporting the secondary market. Or as Walker said, if you have uh, 
auto manufacturers and they're encouraging used sales of their cars. That's supporting the secondary market. So it may be easier to instead say, uh, why do some firms discourage used goods markets? So let's start by answering that question. And uh, what I'll be doing is showing you some of the existing answers. And then at the end, I'll get into uh, my reason why I think this could be happening or an additional uh, reason. And that's just in development. So I uh, would be pleased to hear any of your comments and stop me at any time to ask questions. OK. So uh, before we get into the theory, let's look at some more real world examples. What do we have here? We know that car manufacturers support. We know that Universal Studios shut down markets. What else could there be? Uh, there's a bunch of real world examples of supporting used goods markets. So first off, there's Patagonia Clothing. And they have what's called the Common Threads Initiative. So during the holiday shopping season, when the most people are going out and buying the most things, they released this advertisement. And the advertisement was just a picture of one of their sweaters. And then the words above it, don't buy this sweater. And that was what their advertisement was. Because uh, they wanted people to instead uh, reduce, reuse, and recycle. So go out and buy used clothing. But you might be confused at first. Like, wouldn't you think for every used sweater they sell, they're going to lose a new sweater sale? So that's the sort of thing I'll be talking about. Um, then there's certified pre-owned vehicles. So if you look at uh, the PSID data set, Certified used cars uh, break down less than just uncertified used cars. So there is some evidence there that the certified pre-owned vehicles helps to uh, certify that you're getting a good used car, and that can encourage trade. Then we have IBM. So uh, IBM has been in the business for a long time. And back when they were just making typewriters, what they would do is act as the middleman. So if you had a typewriter and you wanted to get rid of it, buy a new one, you could sell it to them. They would hold it and resell it to someone else. Uh, and that might make it easier for you, because then you wouldn't have to, nowadays, post an ad on Craigslist, or back then, put something in the newspaper. And of course, there's all sorts of trade-ins. So uh, you could just go to a golf club and uh, trade in your set of golf clubs. Or you could trade in video games at some stores, or even uh, x-ray machines that hospitals use. Uh, there's a trade in market for that sort of thing. So we see lots of examples of supporting markets. And then we'll also see that there's several examples of shutting down used goods markets. So I already mentioned this Universal Studios versus Redbox. Universal Studios said, you can't sell our used DVDs uh, in your kiosks. Then what else? The Nook and Kindle, so the Amazon uh, e-reader, has digital rights management software. And you cannot transfer the ebooks between readers. So essentially, that means uh, after you've read your ebook, you can't then sell it to your friend for $5 or something. Uh, the digital software prevents that. So they're shutting down the used market completely. Um, then they're similar to shutting down. So this is one that people are always complaining about. Uh, Textbook publishers, if they're releasing a new version of the textbook because, for instance, the financial crisis happened and there's tons of new economic stuff that needs writing about, that makes sense. Uh, but some people complain that, what if they just put out a new version and all they've done is changed all the problems so that you can't use the old textbook to do homework, but there's no new value added? Then they're just essentially creating a planned obsolescence. And because of that obsolescence, you then have to buy the new version of the textbook. So that's pretty similar to shutting down a used market. And then uh, one of the newest things on the scene is restrictive paperless tickets. So I know some of you have been to events that have these. Uh, the Boston Red Sox use them. The Seattle Mariners use them. And Bruce Springsteen concerts use them. So what it is is you have to show your credit card at the door when you go into a concert or a baseball game. And it's got to be the credit card you used to buy the ticket. So uh, people complain about this because you can't gift tickets. If your grandma buys you a ticket, she would have to go to the door with you and get you in. Or if something comes up and you can't go to the show, you can't just give your friends your ticket. Um, so there is some exceptions to that. And please, go ahead. When does <coughs> payment go through? It goes through when you pick up the tickets or when the order is placed? 
I believe when the order is placed, because there is no ticket. You just show them the card, and that's your entrance in. Yeah, so they really want to have control of the market. So another way that they control the market uh, is you can resell them in some cases, but they regulate the resale market. So the only way you can resell them is by going to the Ticketmaster website, and uh, they set the price, the minimum price you can sell the ticket for, and also you can only resell through their website, and it has to be at least a day before the event. So they're really regulating the secondary market. Yeah, please. This, this is a mere curiosity, but Regulation Z allows users to charge back things on, that they buy with a credit card, um, and you have uh, 90 days plus the billing cycle, if you will, or the date of your statement where the charge, the uh, contested charge appears. And you can charge back for any reason, um, but you have to win it. A, a common one is service not provided uh, or not as advertised. So his question about payment, you know, this deal is not final in the sense of the payments literature until that period expires. Now, I'm just wondering what the credit card's fee is on these types of transactions. Because, you know, I buy a ticket, and then I can't go. If I charge it back, can I win that? And essentially get my money back and stick the, with the uh, ticket seller with a loss. Um, probably not, but maybe I can, and I bet that they're paying a big surcharge on this credit card. I bet they're paying a, one of the higher, the credit card company, the company that's taking the payment. Has yeah. To MasterCard or Visa. I bet they're take, paying a fairly large amount on that. Yeah, yeah, I like and your that insight. That's something that you could solve with one phone call. Yeah. You could find out. I'm not sure what you do with it when you find out, but it's just curious. No, I definitely like it that. Deals with and. Well, what I'll say is probably someone already knows the answer because there's been a huge pushback from uh, consumer advocates. And uh, there's this big website that's entirely devoted to getting this sort of practice repealed. And so I bet that they know many of the details. But I agree that uh, definitely the legality of it is, uh, has a lot of interesting implications. Yeah, thank you. Sure, please. I like where you're going with this. They have, I mean, for this kind of industry, they have man, they have very big, they have very large sink cost, or you can say the fixed cost. And to make one more DVD, to print one more book, or just to copy one more software, the, the margin cost is almost zero. So for this kind of industry, if they want to make money, they, they, they must restrict the transaction between the consumers. You know, a very strong restriction of that. It must prevent the transfer of the copyrights of success if they want to make money. So that's why they must shut down the used goods market. Yeah, yeah. So now that uh, Sung has said that, we could uh, just let his explanation hold here. Um, sorry, as he I'm says, so Sung's defined there's huge fixed costs uh, in different types of markets. Or the other way to say it, uh, something else that's going to play a big role, is there's very little depreciation in the market for DVDs and CDs. So if you get a CD, listen to the whole CD, as long as you didn't scratch it, it's pretty much exactly the same as when you first bought it. So like Sung says, there's a big risk of copying, or it's easy to recopy it. Uh, even for the original producer, it's easy to just produce a lot of them. So if people can just freely transfer them, the company might suffer losing a lot of money. Um, and so some other authors have, uh, with data, basically uh, quantified what you were saying. And so what they did is uh, Ishiara and Ching in 2012 looked at the Japanese video game market. So they defined what I said is there's little depreciation and there's rapid satiation. So that's going to be very important. Once you beat a video game, 
you probably won't play it so much in the future. You'll just be like, oh, I've got to get rid of this. If someone will give me any money for it, I'll sell it right now. Uh, so in fact, if you beat it a week after it came out and you didn't damage it at all, then you could just go sell it to somebody and that person would be very willing to buy it from you instead of buying a new one. Or Smith and Tulang uh, from Carnegie Mellon looked at Amazon data and they looked at the cross-price elasticity of the used market versus the new market. And that, uh, in their analysis, plays a huge role in whether a firm would have an incentive to shut down the market. So if you look at uh, the cross-price elasticity of 0 0.088, what this means is how much are used sales uh, affecting new sales? So when the price of a used good changes, how much does the new good change? And that correlates to a 16% cannibalization rate. So what they said is, based on that, they released a paper previous to this 2008, and they said all this hype uh, that the book market and hard copies of books uh, is going to disappear immediately might be too much because, in fact, there's only 16% of used sales directly taking away new sales. But then in this 2008 analysis, they looked at uh, all the Amazon.com used sales data and said it could, in fact, be a problem for CDs and DVDs because 24% uh, of used CDs and 86% of used DVDs directly cannibalize new product sales. So that means that uh, a used DVD, 86% of that market is directly taking away new DVD sales. So that could be a huge problem. And in that market, there'd be a strong incentive, if you can, to shut down the used market. So uh, on my flight into AIER, on the front page of the business section of the newspaper, there was an article that talked about this cannibalization. So I thought I'd bring it and read that. It's called Web Video and Flames Flight o uh, Fight Over TV Fees. So this is Direct TV, and they're uh, arguing with Viacom over how much money they should pay to license their program. So Viacom does MTV and Nickelodeon. And the quote is, Viacom licenses many of its shows out to uh, outlets like Netflix and Amazon, prompting industry executives to worry about cannibalizing traditional TV. So if you can watch a TV show online, you don't have to watch it on TV. Or if you can get a used DVD, you don't have to buy the new TV. That's what cannibalization is. So why might they not necessarily want to shut down every market? The first reason is because it's very costly and in some cases impossible. Like with Napster, this uh, RC, RIAA tried to shut down the used markets, but they couldn't do it successfully. Um, but there's also the reason there's going to be a price increase effect. And what does that mean? Whoever bought the new DVD um, is forward looking. And so they know that if they can resell it, they'll be, more, they'll be willing to pay more for the original. So for example, that's like saying, uh, you're willing to pay the present value of all future utility streams. So you have the DVD now, and you value it at a certain amount, but you know that you can resell it later. So if you can resell it later, you're willing to pay more up front because you'll recoup some of that cost once you resell it. So that's the price increase effect. And then the substitution effect is just another way of saying the cannibalization. Yes, please. Yep, yep. Because they know they have a lot of secondary market to sell against. Yeah. And similarly, it's good for Apple as well because then people who are not accustomed to using Apple platforms are switching towards Apple. So if they buy the used iPhone, then they'll probably buy the used uh, iPhone uh, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And in future, they'll be the customers for Apple. Yeah, yeah. I certainly agree with that. So Apple essentially wants to just have a lot of its products out there. Uh, be the leader in the market, not have other companies uh, out there selling new or used uh, phones. Yes, yeah, sir. thank you. The, on the Apple website, there, there is a, if you go into the Apple store, there, there is a used market for Apple products that they seem to be selling. It's not, I've never bought one of them, but it's, it's not entirely clear to me. Is 
does this impact Apple selling directly a used iPhone or whatever? Or is it uh, they have a franchise deal with some third party out there, we'll list your product and you pay us a certain fee when it's sold, but it's not clear. Yeah, well, w yeah, so what you could add. Is that like refurbished goods? That's what I was going to say. What you could add to that I list is refurbished goods. And they have limited guarantees. I don't think they're taking as is products. I think if you buy something through that site, it's refurbished and got some kind of a guarantee on it. Gazelle, right? They have that huge partnership. Or is it a partnership? Or I don't know, but they're the ones that buy all the used I, I products. Yeah, them. and. Uh, it's an entire industry built around it. So I like what Walker said is you also have uh, refurbished goods. That's another example of support. And then if you look at IBM, they offer warranties for used products. So that's another example of support. Um, so we have this competing substitution and price increase effect. Uh, so if the substitution effect or the cannibalization costs are really high, then there's an incentive to shut down the market. But we want to eventually get to why would they support the market? So if there's only the substitution effect and the price increase effect, in fact, there would never be a reason to support the secondary market. Uh, and that's this famous result in the American Economic Review by Peter Swan in 1970, and it's called the independence result. And what he showed is that prior to this, it was widely believed that some companies would have an incentive to purposely practice planned obsolescence. So produce products that are going to break really quick because then they'll have to come back and buy a new one. But he said, in fact, no, that's not the case. Because people will know that you're doing that, and they'll say, well, we're, not just, we're just not going to pay you as much to begin with because we can't resell the product. Um, so he says that, in fact, there's no reason to support or shut down the used goods market. That's this independence result. But the problem, and that's going to lead to why, in fact, in practice, some companies do support the used goods market. Uh, we can't assume away transaction costs, as he did. So... What are some of the theories for support? Uh, there's market segmentation, so that's what I was talking about. Some people always want the new good, or as Sonny said, uh, they always want the newest iPhone. But this is just a reason not to shut down the market. So you could either shut it down or not shut it down. And knowing that there's market segmentation, you wouldn't want to shut it down if that were the case. But we need a reason why you would support it. So the main existing reason, and this pops into most economists' heads, Oh, it's just the lemons problem. Uh, and that's a huge reason. So if you think of cars, of course, it's the lemons problem. That's what's going on. That's why they support it. So uh, the thing being there is if you can't verify the quality of a car, so there's asymmetric information, the seller knows more than the buyer, then you would not be willing to pay very much for that car because you would just assume it's probably uh, not a very good car. Even if they tell me it's a good car, there's no way to prove what they're saying. So they might just be trying to sell me a lemon. So I'll only be willing to pay uh, what a low quality car is worth. And so then what happens is, since everyone's only willing to pay what a low quality car, quality car is worth, nobody wants to sell their new quality, high quality car because they'll be getting a low quality price for it. So the market entirely collapses for high quality used cars. Uh, and that's called adverse selection. So you can get rid of that by certifying uh, pre-owned vehicles and saying these cars are guaranteed to be good. We had mechanics looking at them. You can trust and be willing to pay a high price for them. So that's the main existing reason in the literature for why you would support a secondary market. Then there's also uh, an environmental reason. For example, uh, Patagonia saying do not buy this sweater. Uh, and yesterday I went online, went to their website, and was emailing with them. And I said, uh, do you, so what they uh, explained is it's a partnership with eBay. So eBay sets up the store for them to sell all their used clothing. But Patagonia hypes it and advertises it on their website and supports staff to promoting it. So they're paying something to support this market. And I said, uh, does eBay give you a cut? So the transaction commission costs that eBay charges? And they don't. Uh, Patagonia gets paid none of that. No fee for uh, advertising this. And I said, well, uh, why do you do it then? And they said, the reason is uh, because we get paid in the future of the Earth. So that's the recycling reuse idea. So that's important. And it's not all that common, though, unfortunately. So that can't explain this entirely. Uh, there are examples of other companies like that. For example, 
uh, endangered species chocolate giving 1% of its profits to uh, protect endangered species or Newman's Own Organics Foods giving 100% of its profits away. But that's more rare. Comps does that as well. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. So there's definitely these companies out there. But it's not explaining the industry as a whole. So what I want to do is uh, talk about the strategic effects. So my contribution is going to be this. We know that there's a lemons problem. We know that there's a few companies that really care about environmentalism, and I think that's great. But there's also strong strategic effects. Please, before I go. Well, for the environmentalism thing, is that I've always understood that as a way to gain market share. So like Patagonia is trying to pull, pull buyers away from, say, North Face, that wouldn't be this environmentally friendly company. Is that a reasonable? Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. So you're talking about uh, horizontal differentiation. And that is some consumers are more environmental than others, and the most environmentally conscious consumers will buy from Patagonia. And I certainly agree. There's a lot of literature on that. Yeah, please. Um, have you uh, seen anything about the impact that it has on trust? For example, I was thinking that the more goods from a certain company that exists, the more that you engender trust between the consumer and producer, and the amount of velocity at which the goods are transacting within the market. Ha have any papers been referencing that? Um, Craig and I were talking a lot about trust, and uh, I think that does play a big role in the market. Okay. Um, as far as the auto industry goes, certainly there's papers about trust. But yeah, that's a really good insight. Okay. So these are the two, I guess what I was inferring is, are these the two main ones, or is there like a third and fourth that you've seen? Uh, these are the two main reasons. Okay. And so what I'm going to present is uh, the reason I came up with, and that's number three. So it's a strategic move to remain the dominant firm in the market. So uh, now I'll switch into the second half of my presentation and explain that theory. So behind any good theory, you have to start with the assumptions. What are the assumptions of my theory? Consumers differ in their taste for quality. So that's what we saw, France versus the US. It's just based on how much income you have to spend on things. If you have more income, you'll want higher quality. Um, there's going to be a leader firm and a laggard firm. So this could be uh, the company producing the cutting edge technology and then a company that's uh, behind them and just imitating whatever they do. Then there's going to be catch up growth or uh, you could call this technology spillovers, or it could also lead to uh, or be the result of imperfect copyright laws. So Christos, I'm going to put you on the spot because I know you know a lot about this. Uh, what are some of the models of endogenous technological change? Um, three main ones in the energy sector, but I think they apply uh, to multiple sectors. Learning by doing, so a company gains more experience every year, um, more efficiency. Uh, price, so lower uh, prices in the market would help allow the firm to invest in other areas. And number three is uh, R&D. And so Soren uh, mentioned this at the beginning of his lecture yesterday, um, and that you can model R&D spillovers and um, accumulates over time, which is what you were also just alluding to right now. Yes, thank you. So uh, this would be a component of R&D. It's essentially just saying, in R&D, um, the company that's farther behind gains more from the R&D. Uh, and the reason for that is it's easier to copy an idea than come up with it entirely yourself. So thank you, Christos. And this is a comic by one of my former professors. And it combines ketchup growth and South Korea. So it's not really a laugh out loud comic, just a nice picture. And uh, what it's saying essentially is technology spillovers lead to convergence. So what is catch-up growth? That's the question here. Catch-up growth is, as I just said, it's easier to copy an idea than come up with it. Or you could also say there's more to learn when you know less. That's the idea of convergence. So uh, I do some other research on North Korea. And here's the model we use for that. It's catch-up growth in the North Korea model. What we have on the far left is the growth rate of North Korea. And it equals the growth rate of South Korea plus this uh, catch-up factor. So if you want to say everything to the right of the plus sign is what's causing this catch-up. So we have theta and nk and then sk 
uh, pointing at NK. So what that arrow signifies is SK is uh, interacting with North Korea and providing them ideas. So for example, if North Korea were to have a more open economy, uh, their firms could learn from the manufacturing processes of South Korea or South Korean workers could come and show them, have new managers. Uh, the flow of ideas would disperse throughout the North Korean economy. So uh, this theta is the speed of catch up. So what you'll notice is uh, on the far left, the growth rate of North Korea would be higher the higher theta is. So higher theta, higher, more fast catch up. Then if you go over here, uh, mu is the level of catch up. And why do we say that? Because if the last term goes to one, then the level of catch up if it's also one, means that the two economies begin growing at the same rate at that point. So that would be to say uh, developed economies grow at roughly similar rates. So once uh, you've completely converged, then you have to start creating your own new ideas and there's no catch-up growth. But in the meantime, that's where it really matters and that's the catch-up growth. Uh, if A being total factor productivity of North Korea, so how uh, efficiently North Korea can convert one unit of capital and one unit of labor into a consumption good. If that productivity is lower in North Korea than in South Korea, then this number will be smaller, hence there'll be less subtraction, and the whole right side will be higher, implying that North Korea's growth rate would be higher. So the farther behind North Korea is, the more quickly it'll grow and catch up. So what motivates this idea? Uh, one application of it is to look at companies that have, uh, countries that have caught up. So here's East Germany. And it's East Germany catching up to West Germany. So this line right here, you could call the catch up. And what's noticeable about this figure is the lowest point was right after the reunification of Eastern and Western Germany. So in 1990, the Berlin Wall, wall fell, uh, as we saw in Commanding Heights Part 1, and the two countries rejoined to just become Germany. And so there was this uh, restructuring lag time. So it's pretty difficult to take state-owned companies and put them in the private sector. So their worst growth was immediately after reunifying. But then there was this huge jump, and the country took off and caught up uh, much closer to West Germany. So they started out as low as about a third of Western Germany productivity, and then they converged all the way up to about three quarters of Western German productivity, where for the last 10 years or so, they've been roughly at. Um, what do we know about this catch up? Uh, it is, as one of the authors in Commanding Heights Part 1 loosely quoted, uh, it's a result of the spread of ideas, know how, and manufacturing processes. So if you're an open country, you can benefit from the ideas that other parts of the world have come up with. So I want to prove, though, that it's not just limited to East Germany, because you can't just sell one country uh, and be sure of it. So here's what I have. This is from Lucas 2009. And this is the income and growth rates of 112 countries. So over here on the vertical axis, we have the annual growth rate, or how fast the country is growing. Then along the horizontal axis, we have initial income, and they choose the year 1960. So what you would expect is countries that start low will grow fast. That's the idea of catching up. So there are two stylized facts you can take from this figure. The first off is up in the right-hand corner, a variant of uh, Saxon Warner's famous uh, 1995 open and closed index talking about whether countries are open politically and open to trade. Uh, in general, it seems like there's a huge pattern that countries that are open grow much faster. Remembering the higher you go up on this graph, the faster growth rate you're growing at. So here, 0.04, uh, then down here, 0.02. So in general, if you're an open country, you're growing at a faster rate. Then if you're a slow country, that's the dotted line, you're growing at a slower rate. Then. Also, there's been this convergence. So that's a second stylized fact. And that is countries that started low, so close to the origin on the horizontal axis, are growing very quickly. And countries that were already doing really well 
uh, didn't have a lot of new stuff they could learn just by copying it. And so they had to be on the cutting edge, industry leaders, uh, invest a lot in R&D to just get smaller payouts. And they didn't grow as quick if they started at a higher income level. But you'll have to remember, I'm talking about firm strategic effects. So of course, the economy uh, of a country is made up of many firms. But uh, even more than that, let's specifically define how would a firm catch up. So what's the theory behind that? Not just a country, but convergence at the firm level. So this is another comic, uh, and what it shows is these two are industry uh, analysts in an auto market, and they're looking at analyzing the foreign market. So what you could have is this idea of imitating an already existing technology. So Agion in 2005 formalized this idea, and here's how it works. Uh, the leader firm invests one unit of labor in research and development, and they will innovate with probability n. And so what is innovation defined as? That is being able to produce a higher quality good, but at the same cost. So if you innovate, then you can beat out your competitors, because you could sell a higher quality good, not have to charge as high of a price, and you'll take sales away from your competitor. But then there's this term H, and this H is the catch-up growth. So the laggard firm can invest the same amount in research and development, but they have a higher probability of innovating. And the reason for that is, uh, even if they don't invest anything, they can get closer to the leader firm just by copying what they already do. So that could be uh, the result of lax patent and copyright laws, because if you're able to perfectly copy someone else, then it might be quicker than reinventing it yourself. But what's great about this paper, Agion 2005, uh, is he goes on to say that's not a reason to support stronger copyright laws. In fact, there's an alternate reason that a firm would want to innovate, and that is to escape competition. So if you know someone's going to be copying whatever you do, you want to constantly produce better goods so that they can't uh, catch up to you. Uh, and that's competing with the Schumpeterian effect, which is always there, and that's creative destruction and the idea. If you get a uh, higher profit, more monopoly rents, then you might like to innovate. So there's a trade-off there, uh, and it doesn't necessarily say we want stronger copyright laws. That comic is so lame it's funny. <laughs> I mean, it's not laugh out loud, and that's what I said. Uh, like, Still is straight. Does, uh, yeah, does please. I think N and both of the firms uh, assume that they're equally able to innovate, or the scientists are like equal scientific capital across firms? Uh, I assume that implicitly it must uh, say something similar to that. But then this H term could kind of also implicitly reflect that uh, it's kind of a trade-off. Like, I mean, that could be occurring and catch-up could be occurring. So it doesn't necessarily define that it has to be either or. You have a good question. Yeah, yeah please. Oh, yeah. Oh, go go ahead. Ahead. Okay, um, I thought, uh, I don't remember the paper exactly, but I thought the N might be referring to the existing knowledge that exists in the economy. And so two firms both have a, uh, a tendency or probability to innovate at that capacity, given that, that the knowledge stock in the economy is a public good, essentially. So that N is, doesn't ma it doesn't matter if two firms have heterogeneous scientific capital, because that N represents maybe like the public stock of knowledge. And the H, it represents that firm, that specific firm's increased tendency to innovate because they're farther behind. It, it, was that also? Maybe yeah, yeah. So um, that is a very good point. Uh, and this actually answers your earlier question. So they assume that all firms uh, are producing a homogenous good. And so if you're both producing the same good in a duopoly, then you'll both get zero profit. And so you want to escape that pattern of getting zero profit. Sure. And, uh, I was saying on this whole point you're making here that one useful case study might be what happened to the Korean car companies in the aftermath of the 97-98 crisis in Asia because they wound up having to sell major portions of themselves to the U.S. and other foreign makers. Uh, and Hyundai, for example, experienced in subsequent years a major quality improvement uh, 
previously to sell You're the really cars. foreshadowing me here. Yeah, previously they were they were uh, having to offer 10-year warranties, which they may still do, but I had a friend who had bought one from the mid-90s, and he said it was just worthless because the car was always in the shop. Um, but it's, it's a lot better now, supposedly, but that was in the aftermath of that sudden influx of uh, foreign knowledge, technology, whatever. Yep. I don't know if it happened because Hyundai sent engineers to Detroit or the reverse direction, but what, whichever way it went, it sort of worked in their case or the other Korean companies still playing somewhat catch up on. Yeah, and I'll come back to your friend that owned a Hyundai uh, because that's really a foreshadowing for what I'll get to. My Hyundai also, yeah, I haven't taken it to any place for four years, so they have made dramatic improvements, as, as you just said. Oh, yeah, I never go <laughs> Soren, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I was a bit confused about this last sentence. Sure. I think if you don't assume that knowledge is public, I mean, this doesn't hold. And even if you assume that, I still don't understand why a lab is going to Okay, uh, tell me if this helps answer. So this is Apple's product, and this is almost identical visual land, at least in appearance. So of course, a company has a strong incentive to keep trade secrets. But just releasing the product uh, subjects you to reverse engineering. But definitely, um, keeping trade secrets will play a large role. And I agree that that paper is talking about one aspect of the market only. So you're saying that the copier What I'm saying is Visual Land uh, made that product on the left in a shorter time period than it took Apple to make yeah. the product on the right. Okay. Yes, so this is imitation goods. Uh, and what it's saying is on the left we have uh, a high quality, uh, sorry, on the right we have a high quality used good and it's about the same price, give or take, as a low quality new good. And so, what you're going to have is consumers that are roughly indifferent between those two. So let's put it all together. What is my theory? Uh, it can be a multi-firm oligopoly in a formal model, uh, but for best illustration, uh, what I'll talk about is a duopoly, and I'll describe the situation in words. So what do we have? There's a leader, and they produce a higher quality product. And then there's a laggard, and they are able to catch up. So that's what we've been describing. What is that going to lead to? We'll get an indifferent consumer. So because products depreciate over time, then a used high quality good has about the same level of quality as a new low quality good. That's considering that new goods depreciate over time. So there'll be uh, some consumers, since they differ in their preference for quality, There'll be some consumers who are about uh, indifferent between either buying the high quality used good or the low quality new good. So what does that mean? Thus, if the leading firm can lower the transaction costs in the used market, then that consumer who is indifferent, exactly equal between buying the used new good, high quality good, or the new low quality good, well, at that point, then switch, and they'll want to buy the used high-quality good. So you lower the transaction cost a little bit, that good gets a little bit cheaper, and the indifferent consumer goes to buy that good. So uh, that's coming out of this idea that lowering the transaction costs wouldn't help all the firms uniformly, because you have to remember the firms are heterogeneous. There's one firm that's a leader, one firm that's a laggard. So the high-quality firm, uh, is less affected by the used market. And the reason for that is because the consumer who is indifferent between buying the low quality good or the used good isn't going to be buying the newest good anyway. They don't uh, have that high of a preference for quality. So the implication is there's an incentive for the leader firm to strategically support the secondary market because it will take relatively more sales away from the lower technology firm competing against it. So that's the real takeaway here. That's the third reason, in a nutshell. So fewer sales, less profit put back into research and development. 
this is just defining the process of how this would hurt uh, the laggard firm and how it would help the leading firm. It would slow down the laggard firm's catch up, and so then it would push the date that the laggard firm could compete directly with the leading firm farther into the future. So instead of catching up in 20 years, if there's a used market, it'll take them longer than 20 years to catch up because their sales are kept low since there's all these close substitutes to the good they're producing. So let's try it out in reality. Um, does my theory hold in reality? Let's talk about Hyundai Motors. Here's the story of Hyundai Motors. Uh, they're established in South Korea. Then they export their first car to the United States in 1987. Then in 1988, there's a campaign to improve their image. So I'll call this period from 1987 to 1998 the butt of jokes period. So as Walker said, his friend complains he always has to bring it to the shop. I'll give you two more examples of jokes like that. Then they're following, you see, this upward curve of convergence the whole time. And in 2009, they're named North American Car of the Year. So they came out uh, and were perceived as initially very low quality. And then uh, just a short period of time later, they win an award for being the best car uh, in the entire North America. So what's going on there? Uh, first, I'll just verify that they were initially perceived to not be that good. Um, some people joke that H-Y-U-N-D-A-I stood for hope you understand nothing's drivable and inexpensive. So your friend may have said that joke. And then this is, on The Late Show with David Letterman, uh, hilarious jokes to play. And the joke here is, if you're on a spaceship that has to be very precise and well built, uh, slap a Hyundai logo on the main control panel. And that's not a ship you want to be in. So there's got to be this pattern of catch-up growth. It's this upward sloping convergence right here. Hyundai comes out. Everybody's cracking jokes about them. And then uh, they improve their image, and they improve the quality of their cars, and they do really well. So in order for that to be the case, they must have been growing at a faster rate than the other companies during that middle time period. Uh, that's the idea of catching up. They grow faster until they catch up. So this is a list of uh, the cars that my dad's had, uh, a Dodge, a Ford, an Audi, and a Subaru and always about eight years after their initial release. So he bought uh, used cars. And he's considered, instead of buying a used car, to buy a new Hyundai. Um, the reason for that is he has a similar valuation for a new low quality car as he would for a used higher quality car. So Audi, very high quality car, but he has to buy it used. Or Hyundai, they're new, but back in the 80s and 90s, they might not necessarily have been the highest quality. So Hyundai is selling cars, trying to catch up what they could have, say, just for an example, been putting 20% of their profits back into research and development. So what does that mean? The more uh, used cars they're able to, uh, new cars they're able to sell, then the more profit they'll get and the more money they'll be able to put back into research and development, the faster they'll catch up. So that means, just like my theory says, uh, Ford and Toyota, et cetera, Honda, would have an incentive to support a well-functioning used market to satisfy buyers like Walker's friend or my father. And instead of buying uh, a Hyundai, if they're right on the edge deciding between the two, Walker's friend got the Hyundai, my dad stuck with the Subaru. Um, but there's going to be consumers that are indifferent between the two. If you can push more people to be in my dad's group buying the high quality used cars, then Hyundai doesn't get any sales, they don't have any money, they can't ever catch up, or it'll take them longer to catch up. So that's the theory, why support the used goods market. Um, if Hyundai isn't able to sell any cars, it takes longer for the company to develop. So that's what we've seen, it seems, uh, in reality. And I would argue that's what we're going to continue to see. Who's Hyundai's Hyundai? Who's going to be competing with them? Now that they've caught up, uh, per se, one North American car of the year, they have to worry about other low quality cars coming into the market. So this is the Tata Nano, and it's produced in India. 
and they released. Do you know how much they charge for those back in India itself or in Pakistan? It's like two thousand dollars. I mean, in four. India, it would be cheaper because their um, car industry is uh, deregulated. Whereas in Pakistan, the worst quality cars are it's more expensive than this. Right. Oh wow, that's interesting that you say that because in South Korea, uh, there was industrial policy, and they. Uh, purposely kept exports high and imports super low. And so the used cars and the new cars available for sale in South Korea were kind of the similar pattern that it was only cars made in South Korea with high prices. So this car, I would love to buy a car for $6,000 US. Um, what they did is, it's an Indian company and there's talks of introducing the Europa version, which would be sold in Europe at a really low price, and a lot of the manufacturers are getting worried. They don't want to have to compete with uh, such a low price. And so my question is, is uh, a Tata America next? Is that coming next? So if it is, then not only does Hyundai have to worry, but Ford, Honda, Chevy, all the leaders would have to uh, maybe uh, look at these strategic effects in that case. So like I said, I would come back and wrap it all up by talking about the environmental impacts. So you might initially assume that supporting reuse would be good for the environment. And of course, that's because if there's less uh, need to extract natural resources and minerals from the ground, then that could be good for the environment. But as Energy Star, Energy Star says, um, that might not always be the case because there's a trade-off, and that is if innovation is rapid, then you might be able to get more efficient, such as uh, Energy Star certified refrigerators uh, that use less energy and more efficient products. So in that case, those could also be good for the environment. Or maybe the best example, showing that there's a trade-off. It could go either way. It's good not to have new extraction, but it's also good not to use as much fuel. And that would be the Chevy Volt. The Chevy Volt, you would have to buy a new car if you want it. But once you buy it, you're then uh, using more electricity rather than gasoline. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is definitely another argument entirely. Whether the Chevy Volt is ready for the markets uh, or our infrastructure is developed, I agree, certainly. Um, but one day, something like that could be good. Um, and why is understanding how used markets interact with new markets uh, going to be of utmost importance into the future? Uh, and why is it already? so important even in addition to firms, it's because governments have intervened as well. Uh, Microsoft and the United Nations teamed together and started this program where they resell used computers uh, in Uganda and other, uh, other countries. And so they're supporting the used market for computers, uh, specifically developing a program where they ship them around the world. And then, uh, one of the most famous ones in the United States is the Cash for Clunkers program in 2009. So most argue, if you look at, uh, at the same time period from Canada, uh, what you'll see is the used car sales in the United States and the new car sales in the United States were affected, but affected in a way that probably didn't have very many long-term effects. And so what does that mean? Uh, what the Cash for Clunkers program did is it said, I'll give new car buyers, the government says this, I'll give new car buyers a rebate if they buy a new car and agree to trade in their old car. So uh, it had a good idea to start with, and that was to get really bad old cars off the road. But in practice, it probably didn't necessarily do that. And what it did do is it made a lot of new car sales happen right when the rebate was going. But then people that had bought the new car uh, decided not to, of course, buy a car the next period or the next month, whereas uh, they otherwise would have. So it just shifted the timing of sales and probably didn't have that much of an effect. But that program was really expensive for taxpayers, a $3 billion price tag for those subsidies. Uh, so not only do we care what firms are doing, we care what governments are doing, and it's important uh, to understand these strategic effects. So that brings me to my conclusion. Uh, firms support the secondary market to alleviate Lemon's problem to uh, have some sort of environmental conscious and also to strategically hold off the catch-up of competitors, thus remaining the dominant firm and pushing farther into the future 
when they'll have to compete with these uh, firms that are lagging and trying to catch up. And future improvements, I'm working on getting a data set from uh, electronics markets, and I'd like to look at the data on that. But otherwise, thanks so much for your uh, great questions throughout, and I thank you very much.